Before the video starts, just a quick reminder to go check out The Chilling App. If you can't get enough content from me here on this channel, myself and other narrators here on YouTube are providing hours of unique and spine-tingling scary story narrations exclusively over on Chilling. There's new narrations for me added weekly, and there's new professional narrators constantly being added to the list. There's literally hundreds of hours of scary stories to binge on, from monsters, paranormal, thrillers, and true scary stories. The Chilling app even has classic novels, true crime stories, and chilling original series. And this all can be enjoyed with their one-of-a-kind ambient menu, where you can mix in immersive and relaxing sound effects like a crackling fire, dark storms, and chill rain, and adjust their volumes independently in a sleep timer so you can drift off to dreamland without interruptions after. And guess what? They just added the ability to download stories you're listening to, so you can listen offline now as well. Click the link in the description or the pinned comment to try the free trial of the Chilling app, and after that it's only $2.99 a month, which makes it completely ad and interruption free. Back when I was in middle school, I used to take the bus home from school, but the stop was like three blocks away from my house, so I used to have to walk a few minutes after I got off the bus. Summer was approaching and I had just turned 13 when I started to notice this guy hanging out in his front yard almost every day at the same time. Looking back on it, I think he was the grown-up son of one of our neighbors, maybe only 19 to 20 sort of age, but back then he just seemed as grown as every other adult. Anyways, as the weeks went by, I noticed him smiling at me every time I walked past, but having someone smile at you is hardly the creepiest thing in the world, so I didn't put much thought into it. Then, as time passed, he started to wave and say hello to me every time he saw me, and since I was brought up to be cautious but polite to our neighbors, I always said hi back but always kept my distance. Then this one time, he actually got up from his lawn chair walked up the driveway, and started trying to talk to me. I just figured he was being friendly when he asked me how school was, and I always answered stuff like, fine, thanks, as I kept on walking. He obviously wanted to talk more, but I was painfully shy at that age, so I just moved on by while trying to be as civil as possible. Then finally, one day he walks up and asks me how school was and stuff, but then as I went to keep on walking... He says something about how he always hated high school and was glad that he dropped out. I was like, uh, I wouldn't know, and once again tried to keep on walking. But then he hits me with, wait, you're not in high school? I politely explained that no, I wasn't in high school yet, that I was a 7th grader. He then asked me, well then, how old are you? Which I thought was a dumb question because 7th grade obviously meant that I was either 12 or 13, Maybe a little older if I'd been held back or whatever. So I tell him, I'm 13. And that's when this really, really creepy smile curls on his lips. And he responds, 13? No, I don't think so. I was actually kind of offended, thinking that he was accusing me of lying or whatever. So I told him when my birthday was, like that it was going to convince him otherwise, I guess. But that wasn't really the issue at all. And even after I told him, he just kept smiling, then said, Well, you sure don't look 13. Here, give me your number, and I'll take you down to Willow Creek sometime for some beers. I think I felt every inch of my skin on my body trying to crawl off my skeleton when I heard those words. And as the penny finally dropped that his interest in me was far more from neighborly, I walked away faster than I ever had before. I know this might sound a little overly sensitive as he didn't actually touch me or say anything too explicit, but I was still so creeped out that by the time I got to the front door of my house, I was practically on the verge of tears. I was young, but I knew enough about the world to know what he had in mind for me, along with how wrong it was that someone of his age was approaching 13-year-old girls and offering them beer. Upon walking into the kitchen, my mom instantly recognized that something was wrong, and as soon as she asked me what it was, I just broke down and told her. I remember how she was just so calm about the whole thing, 
telling me that it's all going to be okay, sweetie. You did the right thing by telling us. I also remember how, as I traipsed upstairs to my room, she picked up the phone and started to call someone. Dad wasn't home at his usual time, and when he finally did get back home from work, he seemed a little more flustered than usual. I'm guessing it was him that went over to our neighbor's house to tell them what their son had did. And although I don't know exactly how that all went down, the neighbor guy didn't bother me again. He just sat there like a scolded dog whenever I walked past their house on the way home from school. It didn't stop him from staring though, and it gave me the creeps every time I walked past because after accidentally making eye contact a few times and seeing the way that he was looking at me, I knew I wasn't exactly his favorite person anymore. I was always scared that he might just snap as I walked past, that he'd stomp up the driveway and do something in revenge for me telling on him, but thankfully he never did. Then one day, he just wasn't there anymore. The lawn chair was still there, but it was empty. I can't even tell you how happy that made me. It was like a great weight had been lifted from my shoulders and I'd gotten so used to dreading that particular stretch of my walk that it was actually a little jarring to think that I was suddenly just free of him. I never saw the guy again after that and honestly I hope I never bump into him ever again. My mom's dog, Punky, was a very sweet loving dog. She was an ESA dog but trained to be a service dog for PTSD before she lost her leg. I had never seen her get aggressive with anyone in the entire 12 years she lived. She never growled or nipped at anyone, and she had no sense of smell so she loved all animals and people, a real gentle giant among our little terriers at 60 pounds. What I'm getting at here was that her barking at something and being aggressive was so wildly uncharacteristic that I only saw it once. I, an 11-year-old female, was at home with my siblings, a 2-year-old male and a 6-year-old female. My then stepdad is at work and my mom ran up to the gas station to grab a pack of cigarettes. It was only a mile or two away from us. For reference, we lived in a two-bedroom trailer in the middle of the woods, on a dead-end road at the time, and you had to really make an effort to get down our road, find our house, navigate down our rickety driveway and find the door. I'm sitting at the computer having a grand time watching YouTube videos when all of a sudden all of our dogs, about two Boston Terriers and one Chihuahua, perk up, bark a few times and start investigating down the hall. My siblings were napping in the bedroom at the end of the hall at the time so I figured they just stirred and scared the dogs. But then Punky sits up suddenly, stands up on the couch and puffs her chest out. Her ears are perked up, her fur is standing on end her tail straight up, and then she barks, loudly. I mean, the bark booms through the living room and echoes around, and all of a sudden she lunges off of the couch and goes tearing down the hallway. I'm already on edge because I don't think I've heard her bark, ever at that point. She's a Basenji mix, so her bark is more of a baying sound, but this was a big, loud, alert bark. I stand up and go to look down the hallway, ready to fight off what I'm assuming is a shadow monster in the hallway based on how the dogs are acting, but then I hear it. Knock, knock, knock. We didn't get visitors because of how weird our house was location-wise, so my 11-year-old mind had no clue what to do here. The only people who showed up were family, and they didn't knock, so I slowly walked towards the door. The knock drew the attention of the dogs, and they came running back down the hallway, all except for Punky and I felt better with our three Liappy dogs in the room with me, even if they all were the size of New York City sewer rats. I opened the door just a bit, and standing on our porch is the sketchiest man I think I've ever seen. I can still picture him perfectly. He was really thin, a taller man with dark hair and a sunken face, bags under his eyes, and this half-managed hair, sort of like he just gave it a quick brush and then figured it was good enough. Everything about him seemed just a little too thin, a little too shallow, and his clothes were all off too. They were nice, but fake nice, you know? Like a clean, newer looking t-shirt to new jeans, but he had what looked like a suit jacket on. All his clothes were dark too, despite the fact that it was summer in Texas and the weather was definitely into the hundreds that day. 
He also had this plain, unlabeled bottle in his hand. It looked like the label had been covered up and taped over. I stared up at him in confusion because I definitely don't know this man, and I asked what he wants. He smiles at me in this way that was way too fake, like this exaggerated and forced grin, and he spoke in the same voice retail workers do. Hey there, kiddo. I'm just trying to sell this here carpet cleaner. And he shakes the bottle at me. Mind if I come in to show you how good it works? Alarms are going off in my head because he just seems so off. Looking back with an adult perspective, the fact that he didn't ask if my parents were home is unnerving because he probably knew they weren't and that's why he was here in the first place. I should have told him to get off our property, that I'd have to go get my mom, something except what I did say, but I didn't. Instead, I just shook my head and said, no, we don't have carpet. Well, it works on other things. And he took a big step towards the door and shook the bottle at me. I started to freak out and think to close the door, but the thing is, our front door didn't even lock. Small town, hard to access home, we never needed a lock, and so that's basically useless. I'm sure there's something very wrong about to happen and I'm terrified as I think about what to do in the few seconds I think I have before it does happen, when all of a sudden, I hear it. Punky has crept up from the hallway, lowered towards the ground with her teeth barred and snarling like she was feral. She had slobber just dripping down her mouth. Her ears were down and she was ready to pounce. The guy hears it too and as I look towards Punky, she tries to lunge past me and I just barely catch her with my leg as she tries her hardest to duck past me and attack the guy. He freaks out and runs off the porch without another word, booking it down the driveway as I let Punky out along with the rest of the dogs and they start chasing him. Our small dogs chase him down the driveway and stop about halfway barking and jumping about, but Punky stops just on the porch and watches him with her ears perked, just staring in the distance until he disappears. I swear I saw someone join up with him running when he got into the road. The second he disappeared, Punky's entire body language changed and she went back to being the sweet dog that I knew, no barking or growling, just laying around, mouth and throat covered in slobber still. I realize my siblings are still down the hall and run to check on them, and when I get to the bedroom, my siblings were sleeping soundly still. But the bedroom window was wide open, the curtains pushed all to one side and the items on the dresser in front of the window all shoved around. Someone had tried to climb through the window, and no doubt in my mind about it. And from what I can gather, the bedroom window was visible from the couch where Punky was sleeping so I think someone was trying to climb through the window before Punky went after them and scared them off, and the man at the door was meant to distract me. They definitely didn't expect Punky, a bigger dog, because most of the time she was with my mom inside while our small dogs were the ones that saw public eye more often. I don't know what they intended to do, but after my mom got home she took all of us to my aunt's house, and on our way there we saw the men walking up someone else's driveway. Men, plural because we watched a second one split off to wait by the road. This will be a little long, but it still gives me nightmares. I'm a 21-year-old female. I drive from Miami to Daytona Beach near Orlando almost every other week. I make sure to fuel up before I start off, but this one day, this one unfortunate day, I didn't. I left Daytona around 12 a.m. driving back to Miami. I drive a black Mustang 40th anniversary here and there. I was jamming to some good music, not paying much attention to what was going on with my fuel tank. And around 2.30 to 2.45 a.m., the low fuel warning came up. I saw it and started looking for the nearest exit, which happened to be Boynton Beach. I'd never been there and had no idea, still don't know how the area is. I took the exit and saw that there's a Circle K right off the exit. I was a little relieved because now I at least wouldn't run out of fuel in the middle of nowhere. Now with barely any fuel left in my car, I pull up to this gas station. It's totally empty and I cannot even see a single car inside or even outside on the road. There were no people other than one tall man in a red colored jacket walking around near the side of the gas station store where all the parking is. but he was not very close to the pump that I was at. 
I was a little scared, but I usually try to shake my fear off by telling myself that it's nothing. This man at this point is looking at the ground, but kind of walking in the general direction of my car. I'm still inside the car contemplating whether or not I should get out or stay in. Usually I would have just gotten out and fueled and not feeling scared at all. But that day something in my gut told me to lock the door and wait inside until he either goes away or walks past my car. At this point, this guy is just a few feet away from my car, still not looking at me. I'm trying to tell myself, it's okay, he doesn't even care that I'm here, I should get out. But then, my worst fears come to life. This man looks straight at me and dashes towards the driver's side door and tries to pry it open. At this point, it's around 3am with no other people in the general vicinity. I literally froze for a second and thought that I was going to die. He pulled on the door handle several times trying to get it to open, but then I somehow got my senses back, turned the car on and floored it. He didn't let go of the door handle until I started the car and hit the gas pedal, and I'm so thankful that despite the low fuel my car still started up and drove off. I had nothing on me to defend myself, nothing at all other than a plastic fork I got from Panda Express earlier that day. I still can't get over the whole experience and it still scares the life out of me to this day. When I was younger, I met a man. He was my brother's friend, and he started living with us after his parents had done some despicable things, and he was left practically alone and a minor still attending school, though I can't remember if he was emancipated or supposed to be under someone else's care. I was an annoying little sister then, seven years younger, but I remember him saying to my brother, I don't mind at all, she reminds me of mine. What really gets me about this story, this experience, was that I somehow didn't realize until about a month ago how important these events to transpire just might be. For me, there's only two events that are unmistakably him, things that he did to me. The first being one night when I was coming down for a glass of water. I began by opening my heavy bedroom door and continued down the creaky hallway and stairs without at all being silent. Just as I got to the bottom platform, I saw him sitting at the computer. I looked at him, he looked at me, and I heard an old news report playing of the arrest of his parents. I felt like I was invading his most private moment, a time where he was obviously emotional and raw and I felt horrible. I paused in that moment because it was such an awkward situation. I just wasn't sure how I was supposed to respond next. But in that moment where I was in my own head, he must have closed the tab and reopened another. He had to have hit play, as I imagined it wouldn't have started on its own, and I heard moaning. He just stared at me, and I'm now even deeper in my own head, thinking like, is this happening? It must have been an accident. And it finally got the sense in me to go back to my room. I can't remember if I ever told anyone that at the time and I just dismissed this as an accident. The second one happened just as I got out of school. I went up to my room to find my bubble back TV was missing. My brother took it all the time either as his own perceived punishment or because he wanted to use it for whatever reason, so I started by storming into his room and demanding where it was. The prong in my screw on cable cord was getting bad and it was such a hassle to set up again and again and I was aggravated. He tells me he'd has no idea and he couldn't care less. So confused, I'm now wondering who else would take it. I'm not grounded. My brother doesn't have it. Could it be his friend? I go up to his room and I knock. He sounds angry and I ask if he took it. Through the door he said he did, and going back to my aggravated state, I open it up to see it sitting on the ground, seemingly unused. I then angrily say, why did you take my TV? And before I know it, he's bum-rushing me into a wall and lifts me higher up by my throat. I start yelling at him, yelling in general, trying to fight back, and my mom runs up the stairs and screams at him. She tells him to let go of me and to get the F out, as my brother comes up out of his room with the most puzzled look on his face, asking, what are you doing? His friend then leaves, and I can't remember him coming back and living with us after that. A while later, my brother moved to a new house in the same neighborhood, and for years, he would on and off allow that friend to stay with him. He felt bad for him, thought he was given an unfair start in life, and wanted to help him out. 
It was before or around this time a man in all black would begin terrorizing me. I've written a story about that on here before, so you might possibly recognize it, but it all started on All Hallows' Eve when I was in fifth grade. It's exhausting to go through all of this again, truthfully. It was something that apparently my mind tried to downplay, dismiss, and forget for a while. But recently in therapy, I was forced to really face it, to realize it was the origin of who I am today. So I'm going to try to briefly explain what happened without leaving too many details out. There was a knock on the door while I was home. It was the middle of the night and I grew up watching forensic files, law and order, SVU, etc. So I was just naturally like, ugh, yeah, I don't want to open this. But like all the dumb characters in horror movies who die in the beginning, I did. I opened the door and no one was there. So I stepped out onto the porch to look and see if they were leaving because of the moment I had taken to decide. But there was no one there. At first I thought nothing of it. One of my brother's friends or something, but sometime later I was sitting on the couch and from there, I saw something dark flash past the kitchen window. It was quick, but I kept thinking, you know, it's probably just my brother or his friends playing a prank or maybe it's just nothing. I had no idea, but I was definitely creeped out. As I sat there, I just had this feeling of being watched, like my senses were telling me something was off. But that didn't prepare me for when I looked up and amidst the slight glow of the backyard, I saw the outline of a man in black standing in the window. In the case of fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, I froze. That was when I watched as he lightly knocked on the window and did a close finger wave like he would to a child. Then he just disappears. And to summarize what happened when my family came home, it wasn't my brother, and they were more than convinced it was a prank. There are more details surrounding these more important events and what had transpired between them and my previously written story, but what really matters is that it never really stopped after that. Anytime I was home alone, or it was late at night, he was there, dressed entirely head to toe in black so I'd never be sure of his age, race, nothing. And there were phone calls that started at some point, but they would only be silenced or a quick breath. And even though I live in a house of people, it seemed that it only happened to me. My mom had picked up the silent phone calls, but they or she would hang up quickly and she assumed nothing of it. Then the next real event happened. I was again home alone. It was a Friday, I remember, because my friends were at a school football game that I didn't have a ride for. Around that time, things had kind of slowed down with the man. It seemed like he was coming around and just staring at my house from the backyard far less often. So I was actually feeling pretty relaxed at the time, considering everything. I was watching the TV show House, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a dark, sudden flash. My stomach dropped. My heart was pounding like a drum. Everything went quiet. I had muted the TV, and it was almost like a who blinks first scenario, because whoever, whatever it was, was making no noise. An eternity had passed in a series of seconds to minutes, until reality came back with the sound of a doorknob. I heard it jiggling. From deafening silence to hearing the unexpected sound of the figurative pin dropping, my stress response chose correctly for the first time, and I ran. I grabbed my phone, left everything else, and went right out the door. I didn't stop until I reached the outside of town. Then I remember laying underneath the streetlight, thinking that this was it, the day it was all building up to. I had been sleeping with a knife under my pillow, being unbelieved for years at this point, and it all led to this. It was either an attempt or he wasn't done with me yet. He could be coming at any moment or at his very next opportunity. I took those seconds to try to gather my thoughts, catch my breath, and then I called my mom. She was out at the bar with her boyfriend at the time, so they picked me up and we went back home. Her boyfriend made us stay in the car and the only thing different than how we left it was that the back door was wide open. It was a complicated antique door and not easily opened even when it wasn't locked, so that should be a huge worry in itself, but of course, they dismissed that too. They said it must have been the cat. Seriously. The most concerning thing for me though was that nothing was taken. Most people would naturally first assume it must have been a burglar, but no, nothing was taken at all. And at the time, there was just a basement full of expensive tools and equipment as my mom and her boyfriend would flip houses and 
yet not a single thing was gone. There was more than enough time though, from my leaving the house to coming back had to be about 30 minutes or so. Sometime after that event, my neighbor then experienced something too. While sitting on his patio with his girlfriend, a man in all black started approaching them from the yard of an abandoned house. My neighbor told him to stop, and he didn't. Then he pulled out his gun, said to stop, and he didn't. So my neighbor then fired at the ground, and in that moment, he must have decided it wasn't worth it because he ran off, tripping over a branch on his way out. That was around the time he stopped coming around. But now, as I previously mentioned, therapy has forced me to face this and try to process it. During the time of those events, naturally, I spent so much time wondering who it could be and why. To kidnap me? To kill me? Do something unspeakable? But I never got any answers from the world, time, or myself until possibly now. My brother's friend, after these events had all transpired and while sleeping in my brother's car, did something horrifying. He set himself up along a levee, at first just himself in a notebook, and would watch people as they walked by. They went along with their day unsuspecting as he would make a record of everyone he saw. Hair color, what they were wearing, race, gender, age range, how long they were there, how often, was someone or alone. And then one day, with a knife in hand, he pulled a woman off the levee and into a nearby wooded area. She was able to fight him off, and she got away, but not unscathed. They slashed her arm, and I can't even imagine the horror she went through in those moments. Following that, I'm not sure how they found him, or how they knew about the notebook, but the only known address they had for him was my brother's and ours. State and local police, as well as I believe possibly a U.S. Marshal, it was a branch of law enforcement I remember being higher up than usual, came to my door in a sudden swarm. They banged on my door and as I opened, a cop slammed me against the door with his forearm and told me to stay back. I was absolutely clueless as to what was happening but it started to click when I saw my brother's friend being walked out in handcuffs from my brother's home. They sat him upon the stairs, feet away from police canines and I could hear them asking where his backpack is. A man said, if you don't tell us where it is, we're going to search both of these houses. I think he sincerely cared about my brother, as my brother did for him for all those years, and so I assume that's why he then divulged that it was under the dining room table at my brother's home. They then went, collected it, and simply left. I don't know what happened to him, but now years later I wonder if everything that happened to me was because of him. The way he wrote down those people's every movements terrifies me, yet almost solidifies, in a way, my suspicion. What if the only reason he knew when I was truly home alone, our routines, was because he has a notebook on me, too? This happened to me when I was about 10 years old, but even now as an adult in my 30s I remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had taken my sister and I out to a movie, and then to get ice cream in celebration of my older sister getting straight A's on a report card. I remember my dad had gotten off of work later than usual, so by the time the movie was over and we had our ice cream, it was well past our bedtime. It didn't matter though, my parents were happy and proud of my sister, and we had a great time, and we took our time getting home. If it wasn't for what happened when we got there, I would have always looked back fondly on this night. We got home at around 10.30. Bedtime was usually 10, so I went straight to my room to put my pajamas on while my sister went to brush her teeth. I remember thinking that it seemed a little more chilly in the house that night, but that's the only thing out of the ordinary I can recall from when we first walked in. I barely had a chance to change when I heard my dad yell our names from what I thought was the kitchen. I didn't know what was wrong, but I knew it was bad because I heard fear in his voice for the first time ever. It scared me really bad, and I bolted out the door and into the kitchen as fast as I could. My sister was already there, and her and my parents were standing very close. My mom looked like she was on the verge of panic, and she motioned for me to come close. She wrapped her arms around my sister and I, and my dad was already dialing on the house phone. Then I noticed some glass on the floor. I asked what was wrong, but she didn't want to tell me. She said we needed to go outside right away. As we headed out the front door, I heard my dad talking to a 911 operator and 
telling him that when we got home, he found our back sliding glass door shattered and objects strewn about the kitchen. We went to the neighbor's house and waited for the police to come. After a few minutes, my dad joined us. He seemed to be well shaken up, which was a new sight to me. The police arrived and searched the house extensively. It was a big scene with all of our neighbors outside and flashing lights illuminating our entire street for hours. They never found anybody in our house. Whoever had been there had come and gone. The thing that gets me is that nothing was stolen. Whoever it was didn't want any of our possessions. What they did want was to take our canned food out of the pantry and stack them into small pyramids on our kitchen counter. They also turned on the TV in the basement and moved a few random objects to different parts of the house. Very creepy. It was like an insane person had been in our home and did things for reasons that only made sense to him. As the police were finishing up and ready to leave, I heard one of them ask my mom a question. They talked quietly and I'm sure they thought I didn't hear. I pretended not to be listening, but I heard everything. You see, we kept magnetized letters on our fridge. I think I had gotten them for a birthday present a few years before and we used them to leave each other messages for fun sometimes. The cop was asking my mom if the messages on there that night were done by any of us. It wasn't. I watched my mom turn pale when he told her what it said. It still makes my skin crawl to this very day. It said, always watching. The police didn't find any fingerprints. They said the intruder had been wearing gloves and for the next few days, the entire family was extremely uneasy. I was absolutely positive that the intruder was still in the house somehow, that there was a hidden place nobody knew about where he could hide and listen to us. I never shook the feeling that somebody was there, and within a few months we decided to move. It was just all too scary for us to stay in that area, and we moved to a house several miles away. We were never bothered again, but I do still think about it. Was it kids playing a prank? Was it some insane person that wanted to torment a random family? Or was it someone that truly had it out for us and who really was always watching? Could it have been a neighbor or someone we knew? These questions still keep me up at night sometimes. And this happened many years ago, but the hairs on my neck stand up sometimes when I'm alone at home and have to check the house to make sure that no one is hiding. I was 14 at the time of the incident. I was home with my brother, grandma, and my baby cousin. My brother had invited some girl over. Please remember that part because it is key to the story. And my brother then introduced us to the girl. She looked normal but seemed a bit nervous. My grandma asked her some questions and told her if her and my brother needed anything to let her know. Anyways, my grandma told me to stay upstairs and to allow my brother and the girl privacy downstairs. Of course, me being the nosy little sister, I wanted to know everything, especially this new girl my brother brought home. I snuck down the hall quietly and looked over the banister. I saw the girl looking outside the backyard and asking my brother questions like, Who all lives here? Is this your guys' house? It's so nice. Hearing the conversation, I decided to listen to my grandma and go back inside my room. I began to listen to music and felt the urge to look outside my window. I then saw a 2000 Chevrolet Impala parked outside our driveway. The door was wide open and it appeared to be a man leaving our home with all of our tech items from our home and packing it inside the car. And this feeling of dread came over me. Yo, what's going on? I said. Then the sound of loud talking was heard downstairs and my brother said, Please, you don't have to do this. Just let us leave if you know what's best. The girl responded. I hurried and ran to my grandma quietly as I can to let her know what I saw downstairs and what I heard. She didn't understand the severity of what I was telling her and began to laugh, which made me kind of upset because our life could be actually in danger at that moment. I heard tires screech and saw the Chevrolet and Paula speed down the street. I called out to my brother and he said, huh, in a distraught voice, what's going on? What was that man outside? I asked, and he didn't reply. I walked downstairs and saw my brother shaking his head in disbelief looking at where our TV used to be. The police came shortly due to my grandma calling them, and we were later informed that my brother and the girl met for the first time that day off of a dating app, and of course they met at our home. 
The girl, of course, set up the entire robbery. She was just the decoy until her boyfriend came to rob us. But this part I'm about to say makes my blood run cold. The guy who robbed us held my brother at knife point and said if he didn't comply, he would stab all of us upstairs as a punishment for him getting in the way. The cops asked my brother to give him a description, but he didn't. Later on the same day, we then heard a truck park on the side of the house, and whoever was in it yelled and threw a glass bottle down and drove off. I'm not sure if it was the same man who robbed us, but it terrified me nonetheless. I'm grateful nothing happened to my brother, though, or my family. It just goes to show you that you can't just trust everyone. Nearly two years ago, my husband and I moved to a pretty safe town. We decided to have some fun while we're young and child-free, so we got an apartment downtown. It's super fun. It's on top of a shopping center with restaurants, boutiques, a theater, all kinds of stuff. We've had a blast living here and have always felt very safe. I like to go on walks. Since the area is so busy, I've always just walked here when I'm alone. I go on a walk about every other day, less in the winter. Anyway, for two years, I've seen this older man sitting in the shopping center. He always gave me a really bad feeling, so if I came upon him, I tried to divert my path. But I felt bad for judging. I said maybe I was just paranoid. Maybe he's old and lonely and just wants to be out around people. Well, the other night there was a shooting in the shopping center. It was around 10 at night and I never go out that late by myself, so I didn't even know about it until the next morning. It turns out... That same older man had kidnapped a woman in the shopping center at gunpoint, assaulted her, and tried to drive away with her. Her husband drove after them and shot at the guy, and she was rescued, and he's in jail. He admitted to the police that he's been stalking that shopping center for victims, watching the women around there. I cannot tell you how many times in the past two years I've crossed paths with this man, how many times I felt guilty for feeling uncomfortable around him. How many times I was right in his path, an easy target. Always trust your gut. Always. For some background, I'm a male in my late 20s, living in northern Canada. Last weekend, I got a call from a friend telling me that while on his ski doo ride, he went by my cabin as it was on his route and that it looked like someone broke into and smashed out all the windows. Devastated, I went to my shed to load up my ski doo and sled with boards and tarps to repair the windows, hopeful to keep some of the snow out of my cabin until I can properly replace the windows in the spring. Just as I was about to leave, I got this gut feeling that something was wrong and that I should take a rifle just in case. Better to be safe than sorry. Just as I started my ride into the woods, I noticed the sky getting darker and thinking to myself, great, now I have to deal with a storm as well. Luckily, it wasn't a snowstorm, but a thick fog that rolled in fast. There's nothing more unsettling than being alone in the woods, encased in a thick fog, especially with God knows what around you. I finally get to my cabin and sure enough, all of my windows are smashed. I unload my gear and get to work trying to get my cabin secure as fast as I can to get out of there. At some point I feel like I'm being watched, which gives me a lump in my throat because I can't see anything in this fog. I hear something moving through the trees and automatically grab my rifle and put my back to the cabin, hoping that if something comes out of the fog that I'll be ready for it. My first thought that it was some idiot who broke into my cabin, coming back under the cover of fog to see what else they could take. But then I realized that no ski doo approached me, as I would have heard one from miles away as it was so quiet out there. After waiting a while with no more noises coming from the woods, I go back to work, get my windows fixed, and return back to my ski doo to get out of there. After a short ride, I noticed something that looked like potholes in the middle of the trail. It turned out to be polar bear tracks, leading directly towards my cabin. That creepy feeling of being watched and the noises from the woods was a polar bear stalking me and was the actual culprit of the break-in at my cabin. What disturbs me the most is that I would never see it coming with all that fog that day. 
and my rifle would be practically useless against such a massive predator. And to this day, I feel lucky to be alive. My parents introduced me to a murderer. Well, a man capable of murder, and we didn't know just yet. He was a down-to-earth stoner, with three kids and another on the way, with a super sweet wife who was also a little crazy. He came over, would tell my parents everything going on in his life, then just disappear for a few days. He always came back with some crazy stories, but never would assume anything bad about him. He'd tell us about how his wife stabbed him in the foot, how the kids dug a hole in their trailer, that his mother-in-law was a psycho, and once he came over, on the run for having a gun at his mother-in-law's. He was there and gone in five minutes. I regularly check our state's circuit court, and dude was never in legal trouble whenever I looked him up, so I assumed that he just had family issues and maybe a couple of screws loose. Last time I saw him, he came over, smoked with my mom and my girl, told us how excited he was for this baby on the way, and hoped that he looked more like him than the last one who was a clone of his mama. We all hung outside together and drove the kids around in the ATV, just BSing about our pasts and our futures. He was hopeful, not a bone in his body said aggressive. He was very empathetic, very family-oriented and just kind. Then he went missing for two weeks, and not a peep from him or the wife. We then see his picture on the news with the title, Murderer Takes Own Life with his name attached. He apparently killed a man, took his body and dumped it, and when the police tried talking to him while he was in his car, he turned, looked at the police, and shot himself. I'm so confused and will never even hear the full story. Two men dead, no closure for anyone, and I'll forever wonder who else I know is capable of murder. Long story short, I'm a waitress at a restaurant and one night I left my job finishing my shift at about 1am. Weekends we do karaoke so we got out later than usual. When I got home I realized someone had hit my car while it was parked which was pretty bad but I was still able to drive it. So I just went to bed and went to work the next day still stressed about having to fix it. A normal guy who goes into the restaurant often, we consider him a regular, noticed my car was hit the next day and asked me if I had found someone to fix it yet, as he owns a shop. I told him no, and he offered to fix it for a reasonable price. I didn't think anything about it, as he's always been a fairly kind customer at the restaurant and has never been creepy in any way. I told him I'd contact him when I was financially able to have him fix the car, and he said that was totally fine. Well, yesterday I called him to let him know that I could pay him to fix my car this week, so if he'd be able to come pick my car up while I worked. He had to let me know that he had a car that I could use while he fixed mine, so I asked him if he'd be able to drop off the car that I can borrow while he works on mine, and he just drives mine to his shop. But he refuses and insists that I drive out with him to his shop at the end of my shift, which was around 10pm. I immediately got a weird feeling and told him no. The only way I'll let him work on my car is if he drops off his car for me to use and takes mine. I told him I will not be driving anywhere with him, especially not that late. He keeps insisting and it's creeping me out, and I just want to know if I'm just overreacting or if this is genuinely something weird that should be looked into or if I can report it to anybody. He's never been creepy before, but the fact that he refuses to take my car unless I go, late at night, instead of during the day like the morning before I work, is just so unsettling to me. I'm a 22 year old woman. This morning I was waiting near but not quite at the bus station I always use. I was minding my business talking to my friends via text on my phone and regularly looking to see if my bus was coming. Suddenly I heard someone calling my name. I looked around and saw no one I knew, so I went back to what I was doing. Ten seconds later, I hear it again. This time I noticed it was coming from a white car a few feet away from me. First red flag. I don't know anyone that owns a white car. 
I went to see who it was, making sure not to get too close to the car, and it was an old man that I'd never seen before in my life. Hey, uh, I'm your Uber driver, they said. I looked at him and asked him to repeat what he'd said because I thought I heard him wrong, but I didn't. I gave him a confused look and told him I wasn't waiting for an Uber, and when I did, he sped away. I didn't get the chance to check the license plate. This was scary in its own right, but the worst part is that I think I have an idea of who it was. You see, about two weeks ago, I received a very, very long text message from someone I didn't have in my contacts. It started with, hello, my name, you don't know who I am, but I see your posts on Facebook every day. It detailed things I posted on there months ago, and he also complimented really weird parts of my body, my ears for example. He also gave me the number of moles I have on my face, which I didn't even know myself, demonstrating he had spent a long time examining me. It was obvious he was trying to be romantic, but it absolutely came out as creepy instead. I must mention I don't have my phone number on Facebook either. I double-checked because I thought that I never had registered it there, and in fact, I didn't. I have no idea how or where he got it from. He had other private information that I didn't post either. He didn't even reveal his name or give any information that could lead me to finding out who he was. While this was creepy, I just didn't answer and ignored it because he wasn't threatening me. I didn't consider it that serious. I still told all my friends just in case anything else happened and nothing did, thank god, not even another text. Until today. I really hope I'm just paranoid and these are two separate incidents but I can't help but think that if this person was able to get all that information so easily, he could have gotten my home address or routes I take daily too. I have started sharing my live location at all times with my friends who are all worried about my safety since these incidents. I might go to the cops with this, but I'm not too sure if they'll take me seriously. Justice is trash here anyway, so even if I did, I doubt anything would come of it. I'm a 29 non-binary, partially deaf, and have terrible anxiety, CPTSD. My roommate, a 27-year-old female, has a beautiful American bully. He's a bit skittish due to an abusive background, but he's overall a good dog. I have a super comfy couch that I often choose to sleep on over my own bed. The dog, Rover, barks anytime he hears someone near the door or knocks. It can be annoying, but... It can also be helpful because often I don't hear it. This night, Rover stayed downstairs with me because I was anxious but too lazy to go downstairs into my room. We have a deadbolt that has a keypad and auto locks after 30 seconds. It's about 2am and I wake up to him growling. Now, I've heard him growling before when delivery people come by and whatnot. But this, it was almost primal. I open my eyes and roll over to see Rover standing between the end of the couch and our front door, hair standing on end and hunched over like a wolf about to take down a deer. Then I heard it. Someone was banging on the apartment door about three houses down. I was absolutely frozen with fear. I felt the blood leave my face and my instincts were screaming at me to run. This wasn't a let me in, I forgot my keys, it was more frantic, I suppose. I had the window open about two inches but used the lock on the bottom to keep it from opening more. I could hear this person mumbling to themselves and shuffling their feet around, then I heard the chirping of my keypad being used. It was rhythmic so they were definitely trying actual codes and not just randomly punching buttons. At this point, Rover had backed up and placed himself directly in front of me still facing the door. Then the doorknob starts to move. Thankfully, they entered the wrong code so it was still locked, and that's when Rover went into a full frenzy. He rushed the door, body slamming it while barking and growling. I never heard a dog make such a noise. I heard the person stumble back, pause, and then giggle. And that's what scared me the most. It was like I had been submerged in ice water. I had goosebumps and I felt sick. At this point, my roommate had woken up and rushed down the stairs. She saw me frozen on the couch and Rover trying to bust down our metal door to get at whoever was trying to get in. She broke the silence and screamed, My husband is a cop. 
We're armed and willing to shoot. A total lie, but it seemed to work as we heard footsteps running away and Rover clicked back to his normal, doofus self. I never sleep with the window open downstairs and have yet to sleep on my couch since. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, the moon is guaranteed made of cheese. Go see for yourself.